Hey, hey, everybody, I hope you're doing well today. This is a really critical view to your understanding of aggregate supply, and it's you need to know the difference between the neoclassical long-run aggregate supply curve and that of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. So pay attention to this video. Make sure you have a thorough understanding of this before you move on to mark macroeconomic equilibrium. All right, here we go. This video is designed to talk about some of the differences and I guess some of the similarities between the neoclassical long-range aggregate supply curve and the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. And what's important to note is that there's considerable debate regarding the long-run aggregate supply curve and that there are two schools of thought concerning its shape. The first one discussed is often referred to as the new classical, the monetarist view of long-range aggregate supply, long-run aggregate supply, and this may be viewed as the more broadly used model. However, there is a model which challenges some of these assumptions, and this model is known as the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. And of course, this model was developed by the followers of John Maynard Keynes, who was an English economist during the Great Depression, and as a result of that, he came up with a different shaped curve to represent aggregate supply. So the different shaped long-range aggregate supply curves lie at the basis of the controversies about different policies to be used by governments. The first graph that we will talk about is the neoclassical or new classical long-range aggregate supply curve. Before talking about this, let me just state that the new classical economists include a number of different branches of economists. They're called monetarists, sometimes they're called supply-side economists, Sometimes they're referred to as economists from the Austrian school. But in very simple terms, what these economists have in common is their belief in the efficiency of market forces and their view that there should be the very minimum of government intervention in the marketplace. And as a result of that, there will be an efficient allocation of resources in the economy. Okay, so have that in your mind in the construct that the long-range aggregate supply curve of the neoclassical model is tends towards the opinion of supply-side economists, monetarists, or those who believe that the government should have as little influence in the marketplace as possible. So let's focus in on this graph. So here's a new classical long-range aggregate supply curve. Okay? And in this view, the curve, as you can see, is perfectly inelastic or vertical at what's known as the full rate of employment. I like to call this also, the ref refer to this as the economy working at full capacity, which means that there's a natural, it reflects a natural rate of unemployment, and I like to think of full capacity as as much of the factors of production that can be employed at any one given time are indeed functioning to their full capacity. And this point here, as we'll talk about, or we talked about in class, is also representative of full employment in the marketplace. So the LRAS curve is perfectly inelastic or vertical at what is known as the full employment level of output, which is represented by YF. This full employment level of output represents the potential output that could be produced if the economy were operating at full capacity and is annotated always as YF on the macroeconomic diagram. It's important to realize that full employment does not mean that there is zero unemployment, but this is something that we'll talk about later when we get to unemployment. But think about it as a more or less a 5% rate of unemployment in an economy. So the long-range aggregate supply curve of the neoclassical view asserts that the potential output is based entirely on the quantity and quality of the factors of production and not on the price. And so if you think about this, what it's saying is that this line right here is as productive as the economy can be. If everything's working perfectly, if all systems are go, everything's humming along, this is the maximum potential. That in the long run, this curve, this is the, the, the maximum output of the economy, or the potential output of the economy. Not the maximum output, but the potential outcome, output. Thus, at this point, the LRAS is independent of the price level. And you can see that right here, in that if it's perfectly inelastic, then the price level, even if, if you were to superimpose on here, and we haven't done this yet, but it's helpful to see it. If we were to take the aggregate demand curve, and we were to draw one AD here, AD1, 
and then there were going to be an increase in consumption, let's say. And as a result, demand went out. But what this curve says to us is that no, because this is the potential output of the economy, no matter how much demand there is, it will only have inflationary pressure on prices. In that, in the long run, not in the short run, but in the long run, this is the maximum potential output of the economy, and all that would happen is that prices would go up, and you would see major demand, what's called demand pull inflation, or rather just a large um, increase in prices in the economy. Okay, so I say all that, but I don't want, I, I want you to realize that right now we have not gotten towards the e putting the equilibrium points together. We haven't put aggregate demand and aggregate supply together on any sort of curve. So I want to sort of make that clear, that even though this, this would be true, right, and I'm representing it there, and I'm using it as an example of a way in which to explain maybe this phenomenon a little bit more clearly, um, we'll, we'll wait till we get to actual equilibrium point in order to discuss that, okay? So that is the neoclassical long-range aggregate supply curve. It says that no matter what demand happens, all that will happen in the long run is that there will be an increase in prices in, of average price levels in the marketplace. And that we can see because we have a perfectly inelastic long-range aggregate supply curve. So no matter what happens to demand, no matter where it moves, it can move down here, it can move up there, there is going to be only inflationary pressure in that the, the economy in the long run could not produce more. So what would shift this line outward. Well, there's another point that we're getting to, but what would shift this line outward is an increase in either the quantity or the quality, the quantity or the quality of the factors of production. If we were to improve the education level overall of an economy, of a country, we could expand the long-range aggregate supply curve outward. And as a result of that, we could produce more in our economy. Just like if there's some magical techno technological uh, innovation, or if all of a sudden there were a war and we took over a whole bunch of more land and increased the land, that would increase the overall potential of an economy. But that's the only thing that can shift it. Okay? So what the neoclassical view says is that in the short run, in the long run, the supply, the quantity that can be produced, the total output of an economy is fixed. And where it's fixed is at the output that reflects full employment and the economy working at full capacity. Okay, so there's the neoclassical view. Now, if we were to switch over to the Keynesian view, expand that out a little bit, you see that obviously the curve looks much different. So the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, the shape of this curve is here shows there are three possible phases and does not really distinguish between the short run and the long run. And that's an important distinction to make. The aggregate supply curve, for, according to Keynes, was one line. There, were not, there was not really a short run and there was not a long run. What's ultimately going to matter when we get to this, what's gonna, what matters is the change in aggregate demand. And that's how you are going to see a change either in the, the, the country's, uh, uh, in the country's output, okay? So what we see here, and what I want to point out to you, is that there are three regions to this graph, as you can see, right? There is a graph, there is region number one, which is right here, right? And there's region number two, and there's region number three. Each one of these regions has distinct characteristics, and in order to understand the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, you have to know each one. Okay, so working in region one, which would be this area right here, okay, the aggregate supply curve will be perfectly elastic at low levels of economic activity. So when, the comp when it's known that there's a recession or maybe even a depression in the economy, this is the area, region one, where the, the economy will be functioning. And as a result of that, as a result of that, in here, okay, producers in the economy can raise their levels of output without incurring higher average costs because of the existence of spare capacity in the economy. That is, there are high levels of unused factors of production 
such as unemployed labor and underutilized capital. Should there be a need for greater output, or in other words, should demand increase along this line, they can these can be used to their fullest capacity at constant average costs. And that corresponds to this region right here. So if you were for a second, if we were to a second, just to go a little bit forward and actually put on here um, an aggregate demand curve, what it's saying is that if aggregate demand moves from here, from AD1 to AD2, right? If aggregate demand expands... Because the economy was working so far away from its overall potential that there's enough spare capacity in the economy in order to incre increase, because what's this saying? What this is saying is that it's an increase of output only and not a change in price. So output can increase at a constant price level here. So why is that? That's because the economy has major unused or factors of production, which I like the term spare capacity, and it can quickly be used up. And this is just an example. Like imagine if, if half of the Nido, you know, half of the Nido population left, there's a civil war, and you know, we have this beautiful science and technology building. Well, you know, they could shut down the science and technology building, leave everything there. And if in two years, all of a sudden, the war is over and a bunch of the, you know, there's a big increase in the price of copper and all of a sudden all the international uh, community comes back, Nido could, without much increased cost at all, there'd be an increased demand for seats at Nido. They could just reopen the, the science and technology building because it's already been built. The money's already been invested in that uh, facility. And therefore, because it was spare capacity in the, in, the, in the economy, it can be put together with, it can be put to use without much change in costs. Okay, so that's region one. What about region two? Well, Region 2 is right here. It's on this area of the curve. And you notice, if you just look at this, whoa, wait a second. So if aggregate demand were functioning along here, and there were a change in aggregate demand, you could see that what would happen if AD, let will just make it 1, and that's AD2, right? And there's an outward shift here. Well, we notice that now there's going to be a change not only in the quantity, but along this region, there's also going to be a change in price, right? So why would that be? Well, that would be because what Keynes said is as the economy approaches its potential output, YF, and the spare capacity is used up, the economy's available factors of production become increasingly scarce. As producers continue to try to increase output, they will have to bid for the increasing scarce factors. So higher prices of the factors of production mean higher costs for the producers, and the price level will rise to compensate for the higher costs. And this corresponds, of course, to the region to the upward portion, the upward sloping portion of the Keynes model. So what about this third region? Well, this third region of the curve, let me erase these, these lines here. This third region of the curve is considered to be where Region 3 here is where the economy is working at full capacity. And so what that means is very similar to the long-running aggregate supply curve in the Keynesian model. When the economy reaches its full capacity, it's impossible to increase output any further because all factors of production are fully employed. This suggests that the long-range aggregate supply curve, or rather that this portion, this portion of the curve, from right there, say, to right there, that's a bad line. From right there to right there, right, is the inelastic portion of the aggregate, the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. So if this is AD1 and this is AD2, what do we see? Well, we see that an increase in demand will simply lead to inflationary pressure or an increase in, pr in price. This third range corresponds exactly to the long-range aggregate supply of the new classical economists. At this stage, output cannot be increased without an increase in the quantity or the quality of the factors of production. So just as in the long-ring aggregate supply curve of the neoclassic neoclassical model, this region of the curve says that once the economy reaches its potential output, once the economy is, is now operating at YF, that very much like the neoclassicists, this is going to indicate that any change in output will only lead to an increase in price. Because 
all of the all of the because the economy is working at its full capacity, its full uh, employment and full in, employment of all resources, land, labor, capital. So I hope this I hope this video brought some clarity on the two different supply long range supply long range long run supply curves that we look at. One is the new classical model that's at the top that says that it's a perfectly inelastic uh, supply curve in the long run in that this is the full employment, full capacity of the economy. What Keynes says is that, well, it depends. If the economy is running way below, way below capacity, that there's all this extra capacity, this spare capacity that can be used up to a certain point. But then as the factors of production are becoming more and more scarce, as the labor, here there's a lot of unemployment. But here the labor is being, there's less and less labor. Labor is becoming more scarce. What's that going to mean? You have to bid up the price of labor. At, over here in Region 1, people work for anything. But as people have options for other jobs, people are going to have to start paying more. That's going to increase the cost of factors of production until we get to the outward limits of the economic potential, and then we would reach here. Okay? So I hope that brings some, some clarity to the differences between the new classical long-range aggregate supply curve and the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. Okay, I hope you found this video to be helpful, and we'll talk to you in a bit.